Thank you, Brother Seth. I, uh, I thought this to be an appropriate text, especially for the day in which we live. Uh, this is things that we must be aware of. This is something that we have to, we have to be um, conscious of. He says, beware, be, be diligent, be aware of, of your surroundings. Be aware of the things, the way that things really are in the world around you. To, and and uh, the, he expressed this in a different way when he said, walk circumspectly. It means that walk uh, uh, constantly aware of all the things that are, are, are happening around you spiritually. Uh, we are in a spiritual environment now that we cannot afford to be um, complacent in. We cannot afford to not know what is going on around us. And this is the reason, lest any man spoil you. Now, when anyone has been spiritually spoiled, deceived, or turned aside in their heart and mind, it is the result of some human influence, whether for good or for bad. Although it is true that there is a certain level upon the, which the wicked one works and our temptations independently of others, his, primarily, his primary means of spoiling is actually through the use of wicked men to influence others. This is something that, that he is active in. And it is for this reason that we are taught throughout the epistles to beware of false teachers. This is more dangerous than many have dared to imagine. Uh, just as Jesus has ordained men to preach the truth and to rightly divide the word and proclaim, proclaim the gospel to the edification of the church and the aff aff affectation of those without, the wicked one, he has his own teachers as well. He has those who he is using to, to lure other men to accept the deception that they have so whole wholeheartedly embraced. Uh, he um, exhorted us in, in Revelation he said, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. But this, is actual, this is actually possible. It's possible for a man to steal from you what you have, to spoil you, to turn you aside. Now, when we're uh, talking about men who are false teachers, men who are actively promoting deception, these men must be approached differently than those who are s simple and have been deceived. Uh, Brother Givens talked about this here recently. There, there is a difference between a deceived, the deceived and the deceiver. Uh, we are talking about people who are themselves deceivers, who have embraced a lie and who are seeking to draw other men after that lie. Let's be clear about this. There is no sincerity in these people. It isn't that they've just embraced something and they're really sincere in their desire to want to help. No, there is no sincerity in these people. They are, in fact, vassals of the wicked one being used for his intentions. And on this note, it is imperative that we be careful of the people that we allow ourselves to keep company with. Now, this can happen on a very subtle level. If somebody that you associate with um, uh, defer to anything other than the Lord, if, they, if just being around them makes you feel kind of dull or, or makes you feel less um, free to express the truth, makes you feel less, makes your hope burn less bright, then you need to, you need to stay away from that person. You need to cut off that... that uh, association. And on a more obvious note, it, it, men who aggressively promote error are to either be approached with much sobriety or to be avoided altogether. The devil has deceived every man that has ever lived at one point in time or another. Uh, we're talking about the adversary that we're dealing with. And the devil knows the Bible just as well as anybody else. Uh -huh. So th those who he has filled with this intention to destroy the faith of those he can cannot be addressed without caution. Uh, it is necessary for men who are in strong faith and wise in the scripture to answer these men for the sake of those who hear. But, however, this is only really to be done by those who are mature and able to handle them. It is actually possible, if you don't have a good understanding and a, an ability to address error, to, to go into this with, with a good intention and actually end up being confused yourself. So he says, beware, that lest, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Now this is something that we are, are very familiar with in our day. Philosophy is something that has permeated almost every facet of the, of the um, so-called church of our day. 
Now, to, philosophy is to attempt to understand the world around you based merely upon man's ability to observe and interpret. Mm -hmm. At first glance, it may appear to be wise. They may use some really big words. They may sound rather intelligent. However, coming at things from this viewpoint overestimates man's ability to perceive the reality of the world around him. Yeah. It ignores the fact that men have been rendered spiritually blind by the fall and that they really are incapable of coming to proper conclusions. Man can't come to proper conclusions about the world around them. Without a word from God, any observation made by a man about life or about death, or any ideas concerning a life beyond this world or immortality are just the vain imaginings of a man. They're, they're, they're in this aspect, in, in life and death and the things that really matter, men are lost. Even the very origin of man himself, the, the genesis or the beginning of life and the creation of the world, without a revelation from God, men are shut up to ideas. They're, they're, the only thing they can really have is theories. And this warning given by the apostle in his day is the very warning that was ignored when evolution was allowed to, was allowed to creep in. It's even, even been accepted in the churches because this warning wasn't, wasn't heeded. Uh, they allowed a man's theory based on his own inaccurate fleshly observation to over, actually overshadow divine revelation. And furthermore, even, even when you have the scripture, even when God has given his word, the very revelation of God given to the human race that they might know him, without the aid of the Spirit of God, even those words will be shrouded in misunderstanding. This is something that the professed church of our day sorely needs to hear. A, a, a philosophical religion has permeated the institutionalized church. It's so much so that it's almost impossible to hear anyone talking about the scripture without approaching it from this viewpoint. I'm sure we've all heard sermons that were just like a psycho, it was like a psychoanalysis of the, the uh, forefathers, you know. I have a sermon on Abraham and it's just like he, you, you sat him down on the couch, you know, it, it's that bad. Men have uh, fancier ways of referring to the art of scriptural interpretation solely based upon the logic and reasoning capacity of men. I call it hermeneutics. You know, if, if you can find the proper procedure of scriptural interpretation, that's what's going to unlock the, the secrets of the Bible. You know? or, uh, some people say the study of the original language. You know? and I, don't doubt, I don't doubt that there is some uh, use in this, but... I, it was a few years ago, I heard a radio program, and they were advertising a, um, a Bible program that had all these different languages in it. And they said, well, if you want to read your English Bible and study that, well, that's, that's, the, it didn't, the way he said it, he was kind of like, well, that's cute, you know. But if it, that's just skimming the surface. If you really want to understand what it says, then you have to get down into the original language, you know. Um, some say that we need to find the most reliable manuscripts. You know, well, there was a, that was a scribal error, and that's really not in this manuscript, so that's, that doesn't hold as much weight as the rest of it, you know. And all of these things at the root, they're, they're philosophical. They, they rely upon man's ability to reason and to think to yield results. And that they cannot be your primary means of understanding when it comes to these things. The teaching of the Holy Spirit and the leading of Christ in these things is where our understanding is founded. And when we approach Scripture, we do so realizing that just as it was God who allowed these words to be recorded for us in the first place, it's He who will allow us to properly understand them. As, as we fill ourselves with this word, as we live according to every word of God, He will open our hearts and our minds and to be able to understand more fully the significance of these words. So that's, that's what you want to beware of, is of, is of um, philosophy. A after the traditions of men. Now just as there was in the days when this word was written, today there are a great many traditions formed by man that make up the majority of some individual's religious practice. Uh, things that have been added to the scripture that have actually been placed above divine revelation. Mm -hmm. In the time of Christ, the, the Jews had done this. They developed an entire system uh, for rules of conduct, rituals, and there was like a whole social hierarchy that they had made up um, that were put above all else. As such was the integration of these customs that they, they were actually interwoven into their very religion, to their very concept of who God was. 
And yet these things started out as the very God-given system of conduct in society, the law. It, this, this is, it, it, actually, it transformed from that. Yet man twisted it and they molded it to their own purposes. Now, they omitted the things that they thought to be fruitless, and they added their own, you know, their own flavor, whatever they wanted to do. And this is in the context of a scripturally lit, literate people. So this is like the, the best possible scenario. Well, and in our day, just as in the time of Christ, this corruption of tradition has continued to happen. Uh, denominations have developed their own versions of things. Even the same thing, even in God-given valid forms of the doctrine, expressly baptism and the Lord's table, uh, these have turned into lifeless ritual because of this, this very same reason. However, this is even more serious in our days because we live in the days of the open heavens. We live in the days when the things that the, the prophets had desired to see to come to pass, they have come to pass. And, and we have a word, we have a testimony of them. So in our day, for this condition to exist, how much more serious is it? Well, we have a, uh, actually have an entire generation of people who have no knowledge of what the Bible actually says. They, they really only know what their predecessors in their particular denomination determined that it meant by what it said. And as it concerns their religion, they don't really know that it has its genesis in the tradition of men. What, they don't know the difference between tradition and scripture. It's actually gotten to that point. That there are actually man-made religious phrases that are so ingrained into the religious tradition of, of church that when the truth is spoken, the idea taught by that phrase, by the individual who's embraced it, it actually causes them to reject what the scripture says in preference to that idea. To, to mold the scripture to fit into whatever denominational template they, they belong to, you know. I just, I'm just going to give two examples of this because I don't want to dwell on this for too long. You know, once saved, always saved. That's, that's something that we talk about a lot, that it's, it has permeated people's understanding so much. When you accept that, when you hear that, what happens when, when you read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6? For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. What happens when you read that, if you've accepted that? Well, there's only one of two things you can do. Either you can find some way to explain it away or cut it out of your Bible. And this is the condition that we're living under now. So that God, uh, the next one, God loves everyone or, you know, unconditional love. What happens when you read texts like John 16, 27, where he says, for the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me. There's, a, there's like a condition implied there, isn't there? If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. If... Or, or when he, he said in Malachi, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Well, what, what do you do with that? You have to explain it away somehow. Yes. Oh, this is something to beware, brethren. This is what he's, he's saying in our text. That if at any given time you find yourself saying, yeah, but, when, when somebody says something out of Scripture, that's, that's something that you ought to be very concerned about. If, 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 if you do not want to find yourself in the position of being hindered by religious tradition, if you're not able to accept the Word of God just as it stands, as what it says, that's something that has to be remedied. So he says, after traditions, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Uh, there are certain natural laws which exist, which the knowledge of may be profitable in the realm of earth. You know, the law of gravity and physics, they're useful in engineering. It's something that you, you need to know in the creation of mechanized things for the use of man. Or the study of the elements or the, um, the physical properties of the earth. That, that's something that you really ought to know if you're going to be growing crops or, or making medicine. or some, It's useful knowledge in, in the world. But as it concerns spiritual things, uh, Christ is not as natural science which can be observed, analyzed, and systematized by man. The, the advancement of science and technology in our day, is, it's actually been the downfall of a great many people. Yes. Uh, a man has taken pride in their ability to, to create things, as they say, but really all they're doing is rearranging things. Yes. No man has ever made anything, anything out of nothing. They're really just re rearranging the existing creation. 
I, I, I had a conversation with Brother Robert yesterday, and it had reminded me of a, a quote from Brother Charles Spurgeon. And he was um, talking about um, the sinful nature of man, but when he said this, he said, let any man create a fly. Right? Just create a fly. And afterwards, let him create a new heart in himself. So unless he's done the lesser, he can't do the greater. Just commenting on man's ability to do anything. Uh, Brother Robert was telling me about there's this... Um, these scientists, this lab, they have made a, a flying robot that is the same size as a fly, and it can move like a fly, but it has to be tethered to a supercomputer. Because they, they, even a fly, they, they, they can't find a power source and a, a hard drive that's small enough to fit in that space that can be programmed to do what a fly does. <laughs> now, what does that tell you about the ability of man? See, this is, men, men have, have, have got off base. They have this, this, this pride because of what they're able to do. That's something that you need to, to beware, to not live after the rudiments of the world, according to the, the study of the elemental you know, things of the earth. The natural laws that exist in this world only do so because God is constantly maintaining and upholding these laws. So to, to, to base your theology based upon what you can see and understand in the creation or by your physical senses in this world, it will lead you to a serious error. So in saying all these things, he gives this warning to beware. For in him, that is in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. And I was thinking about uh, this, um, I can't remember who it was, one of the renewals, I, I was over at Brother Robert's house, he said that Jesus is the, um, I'm trying to think of the word, the effulgence, is that what it was? Javering waters. waters. That Jesus is not merely a reflection of the glory of God. He's not like a view of the glory of God in a mirror. He, he, he's not just an, 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 you know, a mirrored image of the Father, he is God incarnate. He is God manifested in the flesh, not merely as a picture or as an image, but it is an actual showing forth. Amen. He appeared. There's that idea. As that he was and he appeared. He came to earth. He was not come a mere messenger to communicate the will and the purpose of God. He was himself God. He was divine. He was the one who was previously the word, who was with God and was God. Amen. When he came to earth, he was Emmanuel. He was God with us. Uh, there is a, uh, this may be a crude illustration, but this is the way I thought of it. Is that there's a considerable difference, considerable difference between being given a tape of an orchestra, listening to that, and having the orchestra come to you and play. A, a, a live demonstration of that orchestra. Jesus in his coming into earth was, as it were, a live demonstration of God. The revelation of the actual person and nature of God accommodated to the ears and eyes of man. And in Hebrews, in the first chapter, he said it this way, who being the brightness of the glory and the express image of his person. That's what we're saying when it, it dwelt in him, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him and it dwelt in him bodily now this is an important point as it concerns the purpose of God in Christ after his work was done on the earth he didn't go back to being the word his placement in a body is an eternal one and this is a crucial point because it, it ensures our place where he is that a man stands now as our representative in heavenly places. Amen. It required that the one who pay our price for our sin debt to be a man for, to atone our sins. And it was imperative that a man represent us in heaven. One who was able to be touched with the feeling of our firmities. That's, that's our connection because Jesus is a man. The union between God and a man, the oneness that Jesus, that he expressed in his prayer on that night in the garden before he was offered up, when he says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. For this to happen, it required that Jesus have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him bodily. Yes, amen. Now, brethren, you are complete in him. Now, now, mankind in general has an overwhelming sense of emptiness in their soul. Now, people spend entire lifetimes looking and, and searching for something to fill this, this emptiness. 
something to make them happy, something to make them feel complete. People spend their whole lives looking for something to give their life purpose or give their life meaning. You know, This is the age-long question. Why am I here? What, what is the purpose? Men have made considerable effort to exp explain the reason for this collective dissatisfaction in the avenue of psychology. Now, there's, a, there's a number of diagnoses that a man could probably give you concerning this condition. Every one of them has something to do with the function of your brain. Well, you, you got a chemical imbalance or something, you know. It's, it's a spiritual issue. It's not a physical issue. It's, it's man was made in the image of God. And when that image was marred, there was something ingrained into the nature of man that on some level it made them experience this void that was created in the fall. They may not have been able to, to understand exactly what it was, but it's there. For a creature created in the image of God to not be able to fellowship with God and to not accurately reflect and represent Him creates a certain sense of, of vanity, of, of futility in their life. And men did not know with any measurable clarity exactly why this condition existed. Uh, it, it took hundreds of years of God dealing with men for the, the import of this condition to sink in. And, and actually, until the time that Christ came in the world, all it really was was a diagnosis of the, of the condition. There really wasn't even any, there was some hints here and there of the remedy that God would give them a new heart and a new mind. But for, for the most part, so far had man fallen that he had to be convinced of the fact, he had to be convinced and be shown the condition. The real hunger and the real thirst, the real need that a man has as a race was appealed to by the Lord as he was here among us. This is when it all, it, this all came to a head. It, it, clar it was clarified in the preaching of his chosen apostles after his resurrection. This so-called declaration of Christ in our generation, it falls short of communicating the real need and fulfillment of that need for this reason, that they've exalted people and their earthly, fleshly desires above the purpose of God in Christ Jesus and his determination to actually give you a new desire. It's not about your desires. It's not about your hopes and your dreams. It's about uh, this new desire that's, that's satisfied by intelligent, intimate fellowship with God. There's another Jesus being preached who really only exists to fulfill the hopes and dreams of those who follow him. To, to do whatever needs to be done to make them happy and fulfill them according to their wants. But the truth is that Jesus himself is all that we need. Amen. Jesus is not a stepping stone to the realization of our own hopes and dreams. He himself is the true need of all mankind. He is the remedy for the empty void created in man by the fall, which they have tried time and time again to fill. There is nothing that you need that cannot be found in Jesus. Fellowship with God brings man the greatest fulfillment. It's true that you will never be more satisfied than when you are walking in the Spirit. You will never be more, have more joy than when you are abiding in Christ and, and participating as workers together with God and His eternal purpose. You will never feel like you've had more purpose and, and more, more fulfillment. The, the very purpose for your existence is being fulfilled in this, in this oneness, in this fellowship with God. You are complete in Him. Uh, I looked at this from two different perspectives. Firstly, that being in Christ, although we are being more fully conformed into his, his image, and none of us have attained to the fullness of this, th th there is a sense of completion even from the beginning of your birth into Christ. You are given all that you need. It's, it's in seed form, as it were, and it, it is meant to be grown up into in a greater and a more full fellowship, but, but it, there's nothing lacking. It's all there. You get it all. You are complete, even from the very beginning. And, and secondly, the idea of being in Him is, is not a static declaration. It's not you are in Him once. It is an ongoing fellowship. It's an intentional keeping. It's an abiding. It's as you are in Him that you are complete. As you abide in Him, that is when you will be, you will be fruitful. So brethren, I, I pray that we, uh, we would think more fully upon these things, that you would beware, that you would um, be able to see the, the, um, the danger 
of living according to the traditions of men and, and anything other than the revelation of God, knowing that you don't need anything else. All you need is Jesus. All you need is what He has and what He has provided for you.